Hi everybody, I'm Wen Jing. And I am Jun. In this video, I'm going to explain how actors from both the governmental and the market sectors are involved in providing affordable housing in China. And we are also going to look at how their roles change over time to tackle a specific challenge. Then, I will introduce you to three initiatives that have emerged from 2010s. Finally, we will conclude with a take-home message. In the 1950s, China was in a socialist ideology and planning economy. The central government ordered the state-owned enterprises to build welfare housing and allocated those housing to their workers. Here, you can see the view of Caoyang Xinchun, a welfare housing neighborhood in Shanghai. These housing were quite affordable since they are strongly subsidized by the state. The rent was less than 10% of the worker's salary. However, because of the strong subsidy, it was a heavy burden for the state and the provision was limited. And it was only accessible to households who worked in big inter state-owned enterprises or in governments. In 1979, living space per capita was about four square meters per person. And very often, two or three generations were squeezed into one room. From the late 1980s to 90s, China started the housing reform. And the goal of the reform was to develop owner-occupied uh, home with subsidy. These dwellings were called reformed housing. Here, you can see a reformed housing neighborhood in Hangzhou. These reformed housing were constructed by local governments and state-owned enterprises and sell to their employees. Households were also asked to buy those dwellings with an advance payment to finance the construction. The central government was also provide subsidies and with financial resources from all the four parties, housing provision increased substantially. In 1998, living space per capita rose to more than 14 square meters. Many families moved to multi-room apartments and pri with private kitchen and toilet. From 1990s, China started to provide owner occupation without government subsidy, and they were called commodity housing. This is a picture from Banco City, a big commodity housing neighborhood from Shenzhen. This commodity housing was constructed and sold by commercial developers to anyone who can afford the price, and they were built on the leased land from local governments. Compulsory saving plans and mortgage loans were created to fund the purchase. Much of the commodity housing was targeted to middle high income households with big units and expensive landscaping. In this period, housing provision and consumption were booming because all the three parties were strongly motivated to do so. Developers made profits from sales. Local governments got a land leasing fee and tax revenue, and the individual households lived in better homes and started to own assets. Real estate and housing development were taken as a pillar of Chinese economy, and by then, almost every Chinese household had to buy their home from the commercial developers. On average, living space per capita rose to 33 square meters in 2011. However, housing prices increased to an extremely high level that most people cannot afford. On average, it would took seven times of an ordinary household's annual income to buy a two-bedroom apartment in 1915. In big cities like Shanghai, Beijing, and Shenzhen, those numbers were even bigger. To improve affordability, from 1994, China started to provide economic comfortable housing. This type of housing was required from central government's regulation policy. The local government subsidized them with free land and tax revenue. And in doing so, the price of economic comfortable housing can be 17% of commodity housing. It's usually commercial developers who were actually constructing and selling this housing. 
and these housing were targeted to middle-low income households. Ironically, since it was profitable to, pry, to buy the dwelling first and then rent it out or resell it, many wealthy families rather than middle-low income families were buying those dwellings. We can see from this picture that there are many good cars belonging to the owners of economic comfortable housing. Thus, from 2000, the Chinese central government adjusted their strategy to provide subsidized rental homes to middle and low income households. Low rental housing scheme was introduced in 2003 and later merged into public rental housing scheme in 2011. These housing are rented to households with various levels of subsidy according to their income. Here, you can see a public rental housing project in Beijing. However, the motivations to provide those housing schemes were not strong enough. It was not profitable enough for the developers to build, and the local governments didn't want to give up land and tax revenue. Affordable housing cannot be efficiently provided in this way. After 2010, new actors come in to solve the affordability problem. There are at least three innovative initiatives emerging in various localities and sectors. These are governmental developers, urban villages, and housing rental companies. Governmental developer as another actor in the housing system has access to public resources such as government revenue, free land, and tax relief. In this way, their products and profits are regulated by government. They are also allowed to request money from private entities such as bank loans, corporate banks, foundations, and rates. These private stakeholders check financial sustainability and prevent inefficiency and corruptions. Thus, we argue that the governmental developers are some kind of hybrid actor combining the characteristics of the governmental and the market sectors. In Chongqing, such developers provided more than 30,000 rental apartments by the end of 2015. The second initiative corresponds to villages in suburban areas, otherwise known as urban villages. Remember when we we'll talk about commercial developers and how they need to lease land from local governments? Well, these villages don't need to do that because they own free connected land. They build so-called small property rights housing in contrast to the big property rights housing from government land. They sell these developments to any buyers at a price about one third of the price for commodity housing. This is actually illegal. Thus, ownership of such housing is not officially recognized and the buyers have the risk of losing the property. However, in practice, this so-called small property rise housing is quite popular around big cities like Beijing and Guangzhou. The attitude of governments toward these actors is ambiguous. Although they operate in gray areas, they provide affordable housing in a way that other actors couldn't. The third innovative initiative is housing rental company. In China, there are many immigrant workers and new graduates. They don't have enough savings for the down payment of a mortgage loan, and their career is not yet stable enough to settle down in one place. Housing rental companies have emerged to cater for the needs of these groups. These companies are profit-driven, but with a very efficient and innovative resource organization and management. Their operation has actually improved the quality and affordability of rental homes. They have grown rapidly and are financed mainly by private foundations and venture capitals. They provide rental accommodation, including small private apartments, a room in a shared apartment, or a bed in a shared room together with shared facilities. 
So, to summarize, the Chinese way to provide affordable housing started by solely relied on the governmental sector. The state and state-owned enterprises provided welfare housing for socialist workers. When the socialist system failed, it quickly moved to privatization and started to sell reformed housing with subsidy. And later, the local government started to lease land to commercial developers to develop commodity housing. To improve affordability, the central government required local government and commercial developers to provide economic comfortable housing and public rental housing. Since the motivations are not strong enough, they took the requirement involuntarily. In this video, we presented innovative solutions from three new actors. The governmental developers use both public and private money to make the provisions sustainable. Urban villages and housing rental companies are purely profit-driven, but through an efficient management and business model innovation, they provide affordable solutions to immigrant workers and new graduates. In this process, various actors in the governmental and market sectors are involved. In some periods, one actor plays a bigger role than the others to provide a special form of housing and solving the housing need of the majority. When the housing need of the majority is satisfied, the new actors come in and receive resources and policy support to provide new forms of housing. And these new forms of housing are targeted and catering to the needs of vulnerable groups whose needs were previously ignored. So, the message we want you to take home is that in order to provide affordable housing, both the efforts of the governmental and that of market sectors are needed, and their roles should be coordinated well within specific scenarios.